So hello. So maybe we can carry our seat. So maybe we will start our session. So, so, so good afternoon. We have the breach, the launch. So we come back again. Start the new session is the focus on the AML. Uh, this session we have two parts. One part is a uh, uh, one presentation by uh, Professor Wei uh, talking about the. Uh, the new guideline and classification, and the second, we will talk about the survey and the result from the Asia Pacific region, and and we will have the panel discussion. The first part, I will chair the talk, the presentation by Professor Andrew Wei, and maybe my colleagues. We are now Professor Wei Quarter Bell. Uh, uh, he's a clinical hematologist and from National Health and the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's a very known uh, leukemia expert and uh, do a lot, conduct a lot of trials and publish a lot of the peer review papers. Uh, today, uh, Professor V will bring us a uh, 222 WHO RCC classification and clinical implications. Professor V, please. Thank you very much, um, Professor Wong. Um, so I don't think I could talk for half an hour on the classification, and I think um, it would make everyone go to sleep. So I'm just going to talk about the classification for a few minutes and then uh, maybe discuss some aspects of therapy, which um, obviously are relevant to our practice of uh, uh, AML. Here are my disclosures. So with respect to the classification, I'll just make a couple of uh, general practical comments. So obviously, when we have our first bone marrow assessment, it is impossible to make a full uh, diagnosis. And so I think the first principle is that the classification is in two parts. Uh, the first is a preliminary uh, diagnosis. And so I guess the question which um, we can discuss later is, how do you put all the things together into a final um, diagnosis. So at least uh, where I work, uh, what they do is they have an integrated uh, diagnostic report, uh, which comes out, it could be five weeks after the original diagnosis, when all the cytogenetic molecular information is back. And they have a standard template, uh, which includes uh, the all three classifications, WHO 2017, 2022, and the ICC 22 classification. The ICD code, the prognostic score, depending on whether it's MDS or AML is included, and then a re-summary of the morphologic, flow cytometric, cytogenetic, and molecular results so that the clinicians have all the information in one spot rather than having to look at all the different bits and trying to put it together. And so this is done by the pathologists, and so the final diagnosis given there by the pathologist is now the final diagnosis uh, for the patient. So we know that AML is a multi-clonal disorder and we know that with each subsequent relapse, treatment becomes more and more difficult. And so the general principle of therapy is that we want to achieve the best response with the first treatment and I think have an increased focus on trying to either eliminate MRD or prevent MRD relapse such that we're not treating patients with relapsed and refractory disease because that is almost a universally unsatisfactory situation clinically for the patient. Now, just a couple of comments about the uh, classification. So the ICC uh, classification, as you can see here, is a hierarchy uh, such that we start with the left, and if the patient doesn't fulfill criteria for the left box, we move down uh, accordingly. Now, the biggest difference with respect to AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities between the ICC and the WHO is the blast count. So the WHO uh, doesn't require any minimum blast count as long as the patient has the uh, defining genetic abnormality. But 
what does this mean in practice? So let's say you have a patient with CBF fusion, but a blast count of 2%. Hopefully this doesn't happen very often, but would, would you actually treat at that level? And so I think trying to understand classification is one thing, but what do we do clinically is another thing. So in blue, what I've suggested is that for treatment, um, I'm happy to treat a patient with PML, regardless of the number of promylocytes. But for all other genotypes, I would generally just watch the patient until the blast counts at least 10% before initiating treatment. So for instance, if the patient has a blast count of 5%, then I will do a bone marrow maybe in, in, a, in a month. And then if the blast count's moving up, and then if it looks like it's getting very close to 10%, then I'm confident this is a progressive acute leukemia type of clinical scenario, and then we'll initiate treatment. For many clinical trials, however, um, a minimum blast count of 20% um, is necessary. And so therefore you can see uh, classification is just one thing, access to treatment, to trials, and the clinical scenario is equally important. Now, with respect to the ELN prognostic classification, uh, with respect to the 2022, you can see in red the various changes which have been uh, initiated uh, with the new classification. One key question is for patients with favourable risk mutated NPM1, what happens if you have a coexisting secondary AML um, lesion? Is this patient still favourable or is this patient now unfavourable? Now, many of you will be aware there's at least three publications um, studying this question and they are not concordant. So one suggests that NPM1 uh, is favourable and the presence of a secondary mutation doesn't change. And there's two publications where they suggest it's the opposite. And so this makes it very difficult to decide uh, whether the patient is favorable or unfavorable. And so I think in this situation, utilization of NPM1 MRD, uh, I think probably becomes the deciding uh, factor. Now, these lesions uh, mutated uh, uh, AXXL1, BCOR, et cetera, et cetera, uh, these newer ones, when this classification were made, this data was based upon the Coleman-Lindsay paper of secondary AML mutations. But the question is, are uh, each of these mutations individually validated to be of adverse prognosis? And so uh, we've done this analysis where we've taken each of these secondary um, myelodysplasia-related mutations. And you can see here um, there are uh, two categories of mutations. One category, STAG2, BCOR, and EZH, where well, you can see there's no difference in the uh, survival regardless of whether the, the patient has uh, wild type or the mutation or the mutation without ELN favorable characteristics. So potentially these mutations don't really indicate poor prognosis, even though they might be associated with secondary AML pathology. Whereas with these other variants, you can see the spliceosome here, and ASXL1 and RUNX1, that the mutation, which is in blue uh, or in red, you can see is clearly uh, adverse compared to uh, wild type status. Now, is this validated? Um, well, there are three publications that you can see that STAG2, BCOR, and EZH um, do not have a significant adverse prognostic value. So I think based upon this, it's quite possible that in the next ELN uh, update, though these three genes will probably be removed. And my message is that if you just see these mutations in isolation, I wouldn't use this as a decision to transplant on that basis alone. The other question is the uh, mutated uh, P53. Uh, we know that uh, the definition for classification and prognosis is a VAF of at least 10%, uh, but sometimes we see VAFs of below 10%, and the question is, is this relevant uh, or not? The reason for the 10% VAF was that uh, the committee was keen to avoid CHIP being classified as adverse prognosis. However, in a, a, a collaboration um, with Professor uh, Hu from, from Taiwan and his team, we've done an analysis of uh, patients with P53 mutation and a VAF of 5 to 9%. Uh, where you can see uh, that's in green. Um, obviously, there's still not enough cases to be absolutely sure, but it doesn't look like this is a favourable prognostic scenario. So 
uh, I definitely urge, urge you if you have big data sets to try and um, look at this question and see whether you also find that VAFs of between 5 to 9% are also uh, more adverse than having a patient who's P53 wild type. This is important because P53 mutation for many patients is a death sentence. Um, and in some centres in Australia, they are not even allografting patients with P53 mutation because the out outcomes are so poor. So knowing uh, the clinical relevance of this is of one, critical importance. And number two, uh, we expect there will be more and more trials focused on the problem of P53 in the future, and hence definition uh, is going to be critical. So uh, that's all I was going to say about the classification, and I'll just move now to uh, some of the relevant topics with respect to current management of AML. So there's many um, randomized studies which have led to approval of drugs uh, in the USA, and uh, these drugs are becoming more frequently available in other countries, including um, our countries. Uh, but you can see that the general message here is that curing AML is very difficult. If you look at the long-term survival of all of these randomized studies, the absolute improvement in survival is no greater than 10% um, with all of these uh, treatments beyond, beyond four to five years. And in fact, most of these uh, drugs, particularly in the top row, a lot of the benefit is heavily uh, uh, influenced by performing allografting. So that just shows you how difficult it is for any new drug in AML to cure people. And that most of the progress in AML is incremental uh, rather than uh, you know, completely transformative as was the case for TKIs in CML and also atra arsenic in APL. So this is our current uh, AML treatment landscape. Uh, we do tend to identify um, mutations and link the treatment according to the profile, either by genotype or by the clinical situation. And so I'm just going to go through uh, some of these therapies just to highlight some of the areas of uh, controversy which um, still remain at the moment. So the first group are patients with uh, FLUT3 mutation. Currently, we use mitostorin as our frontline therapy unless you have access to quizartinib. And you know that the RADIFI trial limited the study population to patients less than 60 years of age. So none of the, none of the patients were actually elderly. And so the question is, you know, how do we manage patients uh, over the age of uh, 60? And how do we manage patients who are very elderly um, currently uh, we either have mitostorin or we have uh, venasa. The second question is, what about the patients with uh, FLIC3 mutation who are core binding factor? Um, in our institution, we're closely looking at the possibility of using GEO uh, because the patient's got CBF and consideration of adding mitostorin on day eight of therapy. Uh, and in, in Germany, there's actually a randomized trial um, looking at uh, chemo, geo, plus or minus mitostorin for CBF patients with a FLIP3 mutation. And so uh, I think this is a, a relevant question because you know that patients with CBF and FLIP3 mutation tend to have a higher chance of relapse. Often these patients with FLIP3 mutation may present with a very high white cell count uh, at diagnosis. Uh, and our practice is to usually give um, stat doses of chemotherapy, for instance, ARAC, 200 milligrams as a bolus, even 500 milligrams, just to get that white cell count down uh, very quickly because sometimes hydroxyurea takes too long uh, to work and we generally do not do leukophoresis uh, anymore for anybody. For patients that have induction failure to mitostorin plus seven and three, uh, this, this does happen. And in the ratified trial, re-induction with seven and plus three with mitostorin was done in a quarter of uh, patients. I must admit, sometimes if I see patients with a blast count between 5 and 10%, I'm, I'm reluctant to give 7 and 3 in mitostorin again because it requires a patient to be hospitalised for another whole month, uh, can be toxic, um, and I often just move to the consolidation cycle with um, intermediate dose ROC plus mitostorin and only consider if there's a problem with the patient still not in remission at that stage. If the patient has frank failure, however, um, by this I mean the blast count in excess of 15%, then probably reinduction with the same drugs to me is less 
um, logical and I tend to move to giltaritinib uh, more readily in that situation. Now the question is, should you use giltaritinib on its own? Um, that's what the, the label says, uh, but uh, often uh, it can be um, you know, quite reasonable, especially if you try patient, get the patient to transplant, is to use intermediate dose ROC followed by giltaritinib, a bit like the consolidation, um, which was the practice used in the Keith Pratt's paper of giltaritinib 7 and 3, followed by intermediate dose ROC giltaritinib. So we just apply uh, that consolidation regimen um, as a salvage because, again, there's a much higher chance of getting a response with the addition of ROC on top of the giltaritinib. If the patient's uh, in a palliative situation, then single agent um, is fine because you know that it takes a median of 10 weeks with giltaritinib as a single agent to get remission. And hence, if you're trying to get the patient to transplant, hence the combination with chemotherapy. Um, now, FLEC3 monitoring is a really uh, big change in our practice uh, with many papers uh, on this topic, and I'll come to this in a, in a second. So let me come back now to the older, older population, 60 to 70. We have data from the Germans who have utilised 7 plus 3 with mitostorin amongst patients aged 61 to 70, and you can see the response rates, um, early death rates are lowish, and the median survival you can see here, not as good as young patients, but quite serviceable. I think this data is important uh, because a lot of people are using Venasa uh, for progressively younger patients. Uh, and you can look here, the median survival uh, for FLIP3 patients, given 7 plus 3 plus Mido, is uh, almost 24 months. And the median survival with FLIP3 with Venasa is uh, no more than 12 months. So I think at this stage, if the patient's fit enough to have 7 and 3, uh, intensive chemo plus mito should still be standard of care uh, rather than going to Venasa. Now, another question is with these older patients, when using uh, mitostorin plus posiconazole, there is a higher rate of toxicities. And uh, the German group who actually pioneered this regimen, they actually reduced the dose of mitostorin down to 25 milligrams a day uh, rather than using 50 milligrams of mitostorin BD to reduce the toxicities. Many of the toxicities can be cardiac arrhythmias, and so the reduction of the dose of mitostorin is done for that reason. Now, for the older populations above 70, the question is what to do if the patient has a FLIP3 mutation. You can see here, VEN plus ASA, the VEN did not improve survival in FLIP3 mutant patients, and the lacewing study of GILT plus ASA also was negative. Um, you know that the... Uh, there are some European and American groups looking at triplet therapy, but the triplet therapy is very myelosuppressive. Uh, so one option that we uh, pursue is that if the patient's very elderly, uh, we give Venasa initially, uh, but once the patient's achieved remission after one or two cycles, uh, then we switch to giltaritinib because the initial therapy with Venasa generally wipes out most of the disease but we know that the FLIC3 mutation is one of the key resistance factors to Venasa and switching to giltaritinib before progression uh, is a very well-tolerated and effective regimen which usually keeps people in remission for about nine months. So FLIC3 MRD, um, if you don't have this test in your laboratory, um, definitely encourage your lab to develop this because this is one of the most useful uh, MRD assays that, that we use at the moment and that's because um, it's very prognostic and there are targeted therapies um, which can influence your practice if you know that this mutation is uh, not behaving itself. It's very sensitive, down to uh, 10 to the minus uh, 6, um, and so you will have advanced warning if the patient is not doing well many months before a patient has clinical consequences. And so uh, this is one of three publications which has looked at FLIT3 uh, MRD after chemotherapy. Um, and this is a publication uh, done uh, by our group, which shows that in the pre-transplant situation, there are three groups. The first, uh, you can see with the red triangles, where the MRD is quite high, and the patient also has the FLIT3 detectable by conventional capillary electrophoresis. In blue, you can see the patients who are MRD positive for FLIT3, but capillary electrophoresis negative, and the third group are patients who are MRD negative. Now, if you only have capillary electrophoresis testing in red, you can see all of these patients in blue will have MRD that is missed by conventional testing. And is this important? 
Well, on the right, you can see that anybody that has any detectable MRD, uh, whether it's very low up to very high levels, the risk of relapse is substantially higher. And so having this information um, is incredibly useful, I think. Now, the post allograft management obviously has been defined uh, by the pivotal MORPHO study, uh, which is CTN 1506 led by Mark uh, Levis by, from John Hopkins. And so this study, uh, which was presented at EHA uh, this year, took patients with FLT3 ITD abnormalities in first remission, and then at the time of first remission prior to transplant, they found that the MRD positivity rate was almost 50%. And then after allograft, between days 30 and 90, the patients were randomised to gilteritinib or placebo as a post-transplant maintenance strategy. Now, you know that uh, the results of this study were that there was a benefit for gilteritinib after transplant for patients who were MRD positive, but not those who were MRD negative. And so this is where the FLT3 testing uh, can be incredibly useful uh, for determining who should get maintenance. Now, many of us do not have gilteritinib post-transplant maintenance as a funded indication. And so the benefit of the FLT3 testing is that you can monitor patients and when the MRD starts rising, uh, then in our sense, this is, this is FLT3 relapse and then we start using the gilteritinib uh, on that basis because the patient is going to relapse clinically within a few months anyway. Now, what about uh, core binding factor uh, patients with, um, with GO? We tend to use GO mainly in patients with CBF and not outside of CBF. And the reason is that many of you would be aware of the Hills um, meta-analysis where overall survival was most favourably impacted by GO in patients with favourable, but not so much with intermediate or adverse risk uh, disease. Although the alpha study did have a substantial uh, relapse-free survival benefit um, in intermediate risk patients, the overall survival benefit uh, was not, not significant. The other problem with the alpha regimen is that the involvement of three doses of GO um, in the induction plus a dose of GO in consolidation uh, with requirement of an anthocycline does cause increased uh, toxicity. And you can see here that the rate of um, persistent thrombocytopenia with the addition of GO is 10 times higher than not using GO. So uh, substantial thrombocytopenia, 20% risk uh, with GO containing regimens versus 2% uh, with non-GO containing regimens. And this also translates into a higher rate of clinically relevant hemorrhages. So grade three to grade five almost 25% risk of hemorrhage uh, versus about 10% uh, without the GO. And furthermore, a higher rate of veno-occlusive disease. And so therefore, for patients that we want to take to transplant, who are usually the non-favorable patients, uh, we tend not to use GO uh, for that reason. Uh, and patients who are favorable risk, uh, incorporation of a single dose of GO, five milligrams, to get the balance of benefit um, and minimize the risks. Uh, CPX351 um, currently is used in some countries for patients with therapy or secondary related AML. Now, most people will be aware that the mo major benefit of CPX351 is the substantial improvement in post-transplant survival. Uh, and so one of the major questions at the moment is if you have someone with secondary or therapy related AML, should we use CPX? or should we use Venasa? And so from my point of view, because the, the data is so strong uh, in terms of long-term survival for CPX, if the patient is for a transplant, um, then generally I would use uh, CPX351 uh, uh, if the patient has secondary or therapy-related AML. However, even at lunch today, uh, we we're having a discussion about bridging patients to transplant with Venasa, and many of us have pretty positive experiences because it's low toxicity, um, high response rate, uh, and I think once we have large enough data sets suggesting that uh, these similar outcomes can be achieved with Venasa, then maybe um, uh, I think my, my impression would change. Now, what do, we, what do we do about the other patients who are not eligible for mitostorin, GO, 
or CPX351, uh, do we still just give, I guess, boring old seven and three, or uh, are we going to move to the combination with uh, more novel agents? And obviously the key question is whether venetoclax, in addition to intensive chemotherapy, will be the next major step forward uh, for fit patients. Now, most of you will be aware that the various options include flag ida with ven or cladribine with ven, but uh, I think these regimens for frontline therapy are fairly uh, aggressive. And uh, I personally like um, the regimen which um, published by Dr. Wong uh, with respect to seven plus three plus ven, because you can see the response rates are, are excellent. Um, and whether we need to use all of this additional chemotherapy, uh, I think is reasonably questionable. For older people over the age of 60, uh, at this stage, there still only remains one uh, trial in this area, um, which is by our group using five plus two plus VEN. And many people have found using seven plus three plus VEN in older populations to be quite challenging. So you can see the response rate in de novo AML 90% and two year survival uh, in de novo AML over 60%. And in these older patients with a median age of uh, 72 and with three years of uh, follow-up, uh, the really impressive um, observation is that patients with NPM1 and IDH2 mutation do exceptionally well. Uh, you can see three-year survival uh, well over 50%. And so if there's a patient that you have who's 75 years of age, for instance, I think a key question is, do you want to go with Venasa, which requires multiple cycles of therapy, and all of the management issues for months and months and months, or to give one cycle of five plus two plus VEN, a brief consolidation, and then still have potentially very comparable uh, long-term survival outcome. I think this becomes perhaps a question which needs to be addressed by a randomized trial in the future. And the other agent which is now available in the frontline setting is oral azacitidine um, as a maintenance uh, therapy. For older people above the age of 60, uh, post-remission therapies are very relevant because you can see here, um, even for patients who have ELN favorable risk, the risk of relapse at two years is you know, 50%. And for patients who are not ELN favorable, the risk is over 75% relapse. And so post-remission therapy to try and reduce this, uh, I think are very uh, important. Now, with long-term follow-up, um, oral azacitidine uh, still has an absolute improvement in survival at five years um, of 7%, which is very similar to those other randomized studies I showed you involving um, mitostorin and CPX, et cetera. Uh, but this is a situation where there is no benefit from transplant because very few patients were transplanted in this trial. And this is just a single tablet on its own, not in combination with anything else. And so even though the survival difference is not stunning, it's still uh, very impactful for a single tablet. Now, a major question which is often asked is how many cycles of chemotherapy do we need to give uh, before giving oral azacitidine? And there's been a lot of, uh, you know, I think criticism about the Quasar study that there was an insufficient amount of consolidation given um, leading into the maintenance. However, although this might be um, true, uh, the reality is that there's only been four randomized studies looking at consolidation therapy, and there is no difference in survival according to whether you give four cycles of consolidation versus two, one versus four, um, three years versus two cycles. And the only study in this setting which was ever positive so far was in fact the French ambulatory regimen versus one intensive consolidation. So I think from, from the data point of view, there is no evidence that more consolidation is necessarily beneficial in terms of survival for older patients. And I think you give as many consolidations as a patient can tolerate, and then moving on to oral azacitidine, I think is a practical solution. But I generally don't give more than two consolidations to older people because they tend to have a higher chance of complications um, with that. Now, I've mentioned before the scenario of do you want to give Venasa for a patient over the age of 75 or 5 plus 2 plus venetoclax? But here's another option, which is intensive therapy followed by oral azacitidine maintenance. You can see here in a population of 75 and older, the two-year survival is, um, sorry, the median survival is uh, over two years. And so we have three options now, either intensive chemo followed by oral laser, 
uh, modified intensive chemo plus VEN or VENASA. And um, one possibility which we're going to explore in a future trial is, in fact, VEN with modified intensive chemotherapy followed by oral laser. So putting two of those components together, which will avoid the requirement for repeated cycles of uh, VENASA. And the other benefit of the oral ASA is that for some reason, which we don't understand yet, um, it may have a potential benefit in patients with MPM1 mutation, regardless of the co-presence of a FLT3 mutation, with median survivals uh, pushing out beyond four years um, with a population with a median age of almost 70. So NPM1 mutation uh, for patients these days is very attractive because almost every treatment we use seems to have a really stunning benefit in that subgroup. Now, transplantation uh, is obviously another competing possibility for older patients, and most centres are tending to do allografts um, probably up until the age of 75 now. Now, I'm sure there will be more updated data coming out uh, in the future. However, if this, uh, in this population, uh, 60 to 70, favourable cytogenetic risk excluded, uh, you can see here that the two-year survival uh, is around 50%. Um, and so whether this is definitely better to those other strategies I mentioned, uh, we don't know yet. With respect to older patients and the use of uh, Venasa, uh, I'm not going to go into all the studies because most of you already uh, know that, but just to make a couple of uh, comments, I think the Ven duration, whether to give 7, 14 or 21 days, I don't think there's a fixed solution to this. And I think you should individualise it uh, for the patient. So if the patient has an NPM1 or an IDH2 mutation, I tend to go more towards the 21 days uh, because they tend to tolerate that with a very high response rate. If the patient's really frail, um, then I'll try seven days initially uh, and only move up if the patient's had a suboptimal response. And if the patient has myelofibrosis, um, I definitely don't give more than seven days because that will cause very severe myelosuppression. In terms of supportive care during the first cycle, I think this also needs to be tailored uh, to the patient. So if the patient's really frail, um, I don't think it's wise to give the venasa and then discharge the patient. Um, and so I think this just indicates that venasa is a very complicated regimen to use. There's a lot of art required and a lot of clinical judgment required in order to get good clinical outcomes. And there are some patients who are frail who I admit for the whole cycle of induction in order to make sure that we get the patient through safely. Now, in terms of using venasa, I think one of the most important practice points is to avoid early premature marrow toxicity. Um, you are going to get more marrow toxicity if the subsequent cycle is commenced too early. And so I generally try and wait for the platelet count to not be 25, but to be as healthy as possible, um, 75 to 100 if possible. And the neutrophil is not just a minimum of 0.5, but I try to get it above one uh, before the next cycle. Once the patient's in remission, it's highly unlikely they're going to relapse within the next couple of weeks. And so delaying the next cycle by two or three weeks, I think is very acceptable in order to enable you to continue therapy rather than having the patient crash out with marrow toxicity uh, too early. And in terms of the question of how much posiconazole uh, to use, obviously this is a very controversial topic. Some people say 50 of Venn, some say 70, and some say 100 milligrams. In terms of the pharmacokinetic data, you can see this is the PK curve with Venn 400 by itself, the dark blue. And the concentration of Venn with POSA, which is most closely aligned to this, is Venn 50 milligrams. 100 milligrams of Venn with POSA will give you almost twice uh, the concentration of Venn. And that's why Venn 100 with POSA given for 21 to 28 days is not deliverable. This will cause marrow wipeout after two or three cycles. And so if you are using Venn 100, then I would not use more than 14 days of Venn. Now, the last topic I just wanted to touch on was uh, this issue of relapsed and refractory disease. Um, it's very difficult to treat patients with frank relapse, and I think the future will be to try and treat patients at MRD relapse 
to avoid having to treat patients with frank failure. And we can do this because for some of our patients, we have very good MRD markers, which will allow, allow us to identify MRD relapse several months before clinical relapse. And so the ELN uh, defines uh, MRD relapse with a one log rise, which is confirmed with a repeat test on the same tissue. Um, and you can have some patients who are MRD negative, uh, as indicated by the open circle, who become MRD positive and then relapse from there with a one log increase. And so we have very clear definitions of, EL, of um, MRD relapse, particularly for very uh, sensitive um, markers such as NPM1 and also CBF AML. And so the question is, can we use therapies for MRD relapse rather than waiting for clinical relapse? And so the reason um, this is useful is because if we follow patients with MRD relapse, everybody will relapse within three or four months. And so it's almost a, a definite indicator of treatment failure. And uh, we find that for NPM1 mutant AML, VEN-based therapy, whether it's VEN plus low-dose RSC or VEN plus HMA, is incredibly effective against uh, NPM1 MRD relapse. And you can see here in this particular patient, with just two cycles of therapy, the patient went from a high level of MRD, 10% 10, 10 down to negative within two cycles. Furthermore, no dose ramp up required, completely outpatient based, no transfusions, no prophylaxis, and a very high bridge to transplant. We find that about 50% of patients can be bridged to transplant with most of these patients in MRD remission uh, with this approach. And so uh, with the uh, venetoclax plus low-dose RSC, uh, an MRD negative rate for NPM1 can be achieved uh, often with just two cycles of therapy. And you can see here two-year survival um, is 67%. Now compare this to first morphologic relapse with whatever you like, chemotherapy, VEN-based therapy, but with morphologic relapse with NPM1 at the first relapse occasion, two-year survival is 20%, even though there was a 20% transplant rate and a almost 60% response rate with those therapies. And at the moment, with MRD relapse, um, the two-year survival is around 63%, um, with one-third of patients going to transplant. So it's not a randomised study, uh, but definitely the patient tolerance is very good with early intervention. So with that, I'm happy to, to stop there and I'll go sit back next to my chair and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Wei. So very nice talk. Briefly introduce classification of the WHO classification to 22 and RCC classification. Also, he used a major part to introduce the frontline therapy of AML focus on different entity, different age, or different target. It uh, bring us a lot of information. So now we have open for question. So some questions already submitted. So one, ask, one question to ask you, how do you give go in combination with uh, 3 plus 7 in frontline therapy? Maybe it's a very common question for you. Um, we usually get our cytogenetics back um, within two or three days. So if we know the patient's CBF, then we can give the GO on the, on the first day of 7 and 3. However, uh, if the cytogenetic result is delayed, um, then the, the GO dose is just given whenever, the, whenever it's clinically uh, feasible. We tend to use just the one dose of GO and we just use one vial of 5 milligrams and that's because our hospital has to pay for it. And so three, you know, if we ask the hospital to give us, pay for three doses, they'll probably say no. Um, and we don't use it in consolidation uh, for the reasons which I've mentioned before. So we are talk with the, for the phase three inhibitor, especially for unfit patient, integrated vinyl class, patient not a benefit, also combine other deteriorate, also don't improve anymore. But for this kind of patient, all patients with phase three mutation, what kind of therapy can we should we give in for this kind of patient? So, yes, I think um, flip three mutation in older people is a continuing problem. Um, 
15% of our older patients have a FLT3 ITD abnormality and triple therapy is very myelosuppressive um, and you know, the other clinical strategies have not been uh, effective. So when I asked Mark Levis, what did he do? He says he gives Venasa for uh, one or two cycles. And when the patient's in remission, uh, he switches over to gilteritinib as a single agent. And he finds that to be incredibly well tolerated. Um, and he says, usually the patients remain in response for you know nine months or thereabouts. So if the patient's very unfit, not fit for transplant, um, uh, I've tried that now a few times and it's actually very, very good. So we're actually trying to convince Estellas to give us um, access to gilteritinib for this purpose and to potentially do a trial amongst um, the APLC group um, and collect the data and see how our patients go with that strategy. Uh, the, the main problem at the moment is getting access to the gilteritinib. Yeah, and so if there's no access to gilteritinib, then what do you do? But that's a usual case. No? You don't have access to gilteritinib in this kind of situation. Would you consider using other older FLT3 inhibitors like sorafenib and others in this kind of a situation in case you do not have access? Um, it's a possibility. So we're currently doing a randomized trial of low-dose RSC ven plus mitostorin versus no mitostorin. Uh, to avoid the marrow toxicity, uh, we start the mitostorin on day 11, so we're not overlapping with the chemotherapy. The other benefit with mitostorin is it's got a very short half-life. Gilteritinib, the problem and the reason it causes marrow suppression is it's got a really long half-life, and gilteritinib is toxic to myeloid progenitors. So if you give a drug with a really long half-life and is marrow toxic, and you put on top of that as a cytidine plus venetoclax, there's no reason why the bone marrow doesn't recover if you give full doses. And so um, the US and European groups heavily reduce the doses in the triplet regimen. So the gilteritinib is down to 80 milligrams. Mm -hmm. The ASA, they even go down to five days. And the venetoclax, they go down to just seven days of therapy just to compensate for all of that toxicity. So mitostorin and potentially you could use other FLT3 inhibitors in a similar manner. But my advice would perhaps be not to overlap it with the chemotherapy or to give it as a sequential um, strategy if the patient's very, very frail, because I think triple therapy in a frail patient would be very challenging. The, the other question I have is, uh, because obviously oral is a cytidine which you alluded to is very, very expensive and in most places cannot be uh, easily accessed. And uh, most of the subcut as a cytidine trials which were done uh, some of them did show a PFS benefit, but a lot of them had a fixed duration of azacitidine compared to oral azacitidine, which is continuous. So if a patient, obviously oral tablet is easier to subcutaneous injections, but if a patient is able to tolerate subcutaneous azacitidine and you do not have access to oral azacitidine, would long-term continuous subcut as a cytidine as a maintenance be an interim measure till oral as a cytidine is easily accessible to everybody? Even though you could do it, I wouldn't do it because there's been two randomized trials, as you know, which have been negative for subcut as a cytidine, one by the Hovon group and also by the UK. It show a PFS benefit, isn't it? PFS, but no overall survival benefit. Because they stopped the ESA after two years. So till you gave it till two years, you had a benefit. You stop it, you lose a benefit. Similarly, if you give oral ESA for two years and you stop it, you're probably going to lose a benefit, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about a theoretical possibility. Um, patients hate coming in for as a cytidine after they've had their induction and consolidation. And I think it'd be very challenging to drag a patient in for five to seven days a month, jab them in the stomach with all of the side effects um, without any survival data. So I, I, I just wouldn't do it. Sometimes you really don't have access to oral insecticide. Yeah, so it depends what the situation is. So if the patient's got an MPM1 mutation, rather than giving maintenance um, if you don't have access to oral laser, I would monitor them and when they have MRD relapse, then just treat them. And if the patient's got very poor risk disease, the oral laser probably won't make a clinical difference. 
And so you know that most of the patients with um, oral laser in the trials, you know, 70% had intermediate cytogenetic uh, risk. And so, you know, at least half of those patients probably going to have NPM1 uh, mutations. So that's the biggest group, which is probably benefiting from oral laser, as I showed you. Those patients you can monitor and salvage very effectively with VEN-based regimens with MRD relapse rather than ASA, 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 ASA for two years. Yes, yeah, thank you for your excellent presentation. I noticed a slide from you is the uh, is the Vinakas PK uh, plus the Posa Kunzal. Uh, yeah, presented of the Posa Kunzal, and when Vinakas fifty milligram plus Posa, then the plasma saturation is more than. When I cross 400, 400 milligram, that means we should reduce the when I cross uh, dose, then reduce the toxicity for when I cross. You, you, you suggesting what's your suggestion um, if we use the POSA? Yes, with POSA, it's a very Did controversial you? topic. Um, all I can say is that in the phase one trials, and the phase three trials, Viali A and Viali C, when posaconazole was used, uh, we used 50 milligrams of venetoclax. Um, but the label in the US is 70 milligrams, and in some places it's 100 milligrams. Um, but the PK data I showed you would suggest that 50 is closest um, to the 400 of Venn. And Courtney Donato, who's used a lot of venetoclax, obviously, um, she started using Ven 100 and then went to Ven 70, and she feels that the best compromise in terms of tolerability is actually Ven 50 now. So uh, if you ask her in private, she'll say Ven 50. Uh, in public, she has to say 70 because that's the US label. <laughs> so ask her privately. <laughs> She's lovely. So. So one question from the audience asks you, in some patient patients with a single-only mutation, such as ROS, Kate mutation, but usually this kind of mutation responds worse to other and, uh, other and one other class. How do you treat this kind of patient? Yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge. So most of you will be um, aware of that heart with donor um, genetic stratification and the middle group who didn't do as well had either RAS mutations or FLT3 mutations. So the FLT3 mutation um, we've, we've talked about. So the problem is RAS, KIT, and also CIBL, CBL, because they all behave similarly. Uh, for patients with CBL, um, I manage them similarly to FLT3 because CIBL is a negative regulator of FLT3. Uh, and we're doing a trial at the moment to see whether a FLT3 inhibitor will be effective in that population. Mm -hmm. KIT, um, I think there's been some work about avapritinib um, okay, from yep. China, and that looks very, very impressive. Um, so we'd love to do a trial of Venasa with avapritinib in KIT mutation patients. Um, and when we don't have access to avapritinib, we have to use mitostorin. Um, RAS mutations are difficult because we don't have um, good drugs against RAS. Um, so maybe um, some ERK inhibitors which are coming in the future, uh, but the RAS inhibitors which are used in solid cancer, we don't see that particular RAS variant frequently. So it makes it difficult to develop a trial for that. Okay, maybe due to time limit, we can take the last question. In terms question. of uh, your co-binding factor, like A21 with the kit mutations, what, what do you do in such situations? Do you give anything extra or do you just treat and then take them to transplant? Or If I had access to drugs, I'd seriously consider, um, you know, 7 and 3 with mitostorin uh, or something like that. Um, GO... Uh, and watch the MRD and allograft if the MRD is, is problematic. But we don't have a, a, an easy solution for KIP. It's still not recommended to allograft these patients in, in first uh, remission. And so I think using the MRD to guide uh, what should be done 
um, is still relevant. For patients with, uh, you know, problematic CBF, um, Venase is actually quite, quite effective. Uh, but the one patient that I had on the um, uh, Viali C trial who had a kit mutation with CBF, uh, that patient did not go into remission at all. So I suspect kit is another resistance mechanism to, to venetoclax because it drives expression um, of BCLX and MCL1. I have a small question for you again. Maybe last, <laughs> yes. last, last one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, in China, we have not available for CPX351 and for TML or the SML, what regimen do you suggest for those patients? Yes, so a lot of people are using um, Venasa, and as you know, there's been some sort of uh, uh, non-randomized studies suggesting that Venasa and CPX outcomes are similar, even though the Venasa population was older and less frequently transplanted. So that's sort of interesting data. There's a randomized study looking at Venasa versus um, CPX351. So I think if you don't have CPX351, it's not, not the end of the, the world. I mean, there's still conventional chemotherapy and transplant, um, and also Venasa for patients who are not fit we have a generic, the generic CPS351. So if you have this kind of patient, we do look to it as subject into the trial. Yeah, this is a suggestion for you. Yeah, so we should move forward. So let's uh, Professor Wei to moderate the next presentation and the discussion. Yeah. Yes, the, um, <clears throat> you have to help me here, hang on. <laughs> the next speaker um, in this session is going to be uh, Dr. Lau uh, Zhentang, and he's going to discuss um, the survey uh, on AML uh, with respect to the APLC. Thanks very much. Oh, and can I, we also have up to the, to the podium um, the other panel members, uh, Dr. Hu, Dr. Kim, Kim, and our speaker will come later. So... PG and Sinan, please come up. Thanks, Lau. Uh, thank you, Prof. We for the excellent talk. Uh, it's been very comprehensive, and we are getting a great, great landscape on the uh, current stand of treatment for AML. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, so now I'm a presenting uh, our survey results uh, on uh, AML and APML. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ashley Cole, sorry, Kevin Cole and Dr. Ashley Ng, uh, who helped contribute uh, to the questions and, and also uh, assess the, the data set. And uh, currently we have uh, 17 participants and uh, eight uh, countries who are, are represented in this survey. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, China, Singapore, South Korea, Thailand, Thailand and Taiwan. Uh, so actually covering the large swath of uh, Asia-Pacific uh, landscape. So uh, the question numbers may not be in order because uh, I'll just rearranging some of them to, to fit into the flow of the, uh, the questionnaire and the, the, the presentation. So uh, the question is how many patients do we treat every uh, per year? I think most of them uh, at least treat uh, 20 to 30 uh, a year. So that's, that's uh, pretty substantial. Uh, of course, I'm sure some centers go, 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 go much more, especially if it's a tertiary academic places. Uh, do you have a departmental consensus? Once again, most countries, most centers have a departmental consensus, 90% uh, almost. And uh, uh, multidisciplinary team meetings are frequently uh, utilized to, to, to discuss individual patient management, definitely pathology, uh, multidisciplinary kind of uh, consensus. And uh, tissue banking, uh, plus minus, I would think uh, probably about half of them uh, participate in some form of tissue banking, but not everyone. So looking at diagnostics and uh, risk stratification, uh, what standards of care? I think I think all of us are uh, using very uh, standard things, flow cytometry, bone marrow biopsy, aspirate, karyotyping, uh, NGS, uh, which is uh, the, the most important thing that we are looking at. Uh, 
it's about half once again. Uh, not everyone is uh, using NGS yet. Uh, there are some who are using fragment and anal analysis, uh, but uh, that's that's I guess not 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 not, not yet the most uh, standard kind of a testing. Uh, laboratory risk stratification because this uh, survey was done prior to 2022 uh, ELN guidelines were published. So uh, I think everyone is using very updated survey uh, guidelines. Just that uh, probably now everyone is updated to 2020. 2022, uh, just that uh, when, when the survey was being done, uh, this, this guideline was just being published. In terms of frontline treatment, uh, everybody is using a protocolized uh, method uh, to, to, to treat patient. Uh, half, about half is using an institution-specific uh, protocol. The other half uh, using ELN. There's a small, uh, about 20-30% is using uh, NCCN type guidelines. Access to targeted molecular or immunotherapy, uh, once again, about 90% uh, have, have access. Uh, Agents-wise, uh, it's quite a very large, large list, uh, but uh, most of them, mitosaurin seems to be quite quite uh, consistent. Some centers can get uh, GO. Uh, Venetoclax is, uh, I guess, uh, also uh, one of those things that uh, it seems to be not approved in every center yet. Uh, but all in all, we do have a, a range of responses. Most of us are at least getting a feature inhibitor and uh, GO is, looks like it's at least something that, that we, we, we can uh, acquire. In terms of standard of care approaches, once again, most of us are doing 3 plus 7. Uh, uh, two centers are using uh, various combinations of like IDA van, 3 plus 7 van. Uh, but uh, of course, those uh, we are waiting for more data. Uh, induction therapy standard of care protocols, uh, once again, for patients who are more than six, 60 years old and chemotherapy eligible, uh, 3 plus 7 once again dominates, uh, uh, and 5 plus 2 also dominates the landscape. Uh, some of us are using venetoclick space therapy still, uh, even though if they are chemo eligible, uh, Azavan is still one of the things in consideration. For non-intensive chemotherapy options, so which what kind of patients do you uh, 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 classify as being non-intensive uh, chemotherapy eligible? Uh, we use a range of uh, resources, age, being, age and performance status being one of the more common uh, standards, uh, cognitive assessment. Uh, looks like P53 mutational status uh, is a criteria, interestingly, for, for, for about a fifth of us. Consolidation wise, uh, rather consistent again. Everyone is using a high deck, 135 or 123. Uh, there are a small smattering of other uh, uh, types of treatment, uh, 2 gram, high deck, uh, or flag, and various things. Uh, but looks like consistently most of us are doing a high deck. In terms of patients, uh, once again, more than 60 years old, high deck seems to be the standard. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other, but it looks like it's more varied now. We have a lot more individualized type of things. Uh, 5 plus 2, flag, vanilla flag space. Uh, it's, all, it's all in the consideration. Uh, do you manage neutropenic monitoring during consolidation as an inpatient or outpatient? I, I guess it might be related to uh, the healthcare structure of the nation also. Uh, if uh, uh, primary care or uh, admission, you know, isn't isn't uh, smooth. The process isn't smooth. Then maybe uh, inpatient uh, monitoring might be a much better option. So, looks like uh, most of us are still doing it inpatient. There's a overlap because uh, we do some centers do do both inpatient outpatient uh, monitoring. So for treatment. Uh, intensive chemo in eligible patients, what standard of care do you use? Uh, you can see uh, it's once again uh, pretty standard. Most of us, Azavan, sorry, Azacetidine, uh, low dose RSC is still one of those things in consideration. Uh, novel therapies uh, looks like it's uniformly uh, just venetoclax uh, based therapy. Uh, about half uh, uh, bring the patient towards a supportive and palliative care early. Uh, we don't have the depth to ask about the specific uh, criteria to, to, to choose between AZA and palliation, but uh, yeah, we, we probably can explore it during the Q&A later. 
So for P53 mutant AML, uh, what frontline approach do you use? Uh, I think most of us are doing it the same way as uh, uh, other types of uh, therapy. Allergenic transplant seems to be one of the things that if we can manage to bring the patient into CR or even maintain them in, in that way, uh, allergenic transplant is, of course, uh, pretty commonly used. Clinical trials, if accessible, is once again another consideration. Uh, but unfortunately, currently, uh, with the failure of uh, APR246, I'm not sure if there's anything else uh, in the horizon for such a population of patients. Uh, do you routinely undertake minimal residual disease uh, managed uh, assessment? Uh, most of us do, about 65%. Uh, and uh, looks like it runs the range of uh, cytogenetics, fish, MRD, flow. Uh, there is also PCR for MPN1, uh, CBL, CBF, and APL. What routine tests do you undertake or make access for monitoring uh, disease purposes? Uh, pretty standard. Uh, all of us are doing bone marrow aspirate, trafine, flow cytometry, cytogenetics. Uh, about half are doing everything. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's basically about alignment of uh, what kind of data set we can use if we are going to also move towards a registry kind of a, a co collaboration. If you routinely undertake mole molecular monitoring for MRD, uh, what methods you use? Once again, uh, anything that has a good sensitivity probably are the PCRs and, and uh, very deep uh, flow, but uh, looks like PCR dominates the field now. Does your institution perform allergenic stem cell transplants? Uh, most of us, yes. Does transplant eligibility affect your chemo decisions? Uh, three, three quarter, yes. Would you routinely refer transplant eligible patients for allergenic transplant? Uh, when? When would you do it? Uh, looks like we have a very varied response. Uh, most of us do it post uh, CR1, uh, about half already start doing it uh, post-induction and 30% uh, are doing it after CR2, so after relapse. Do you try to eliminate uh, MRD before an allogenic transplant? Uh, I was about half does try to do it. How, uh, I don't think we have any comments on how, so <laughs> I don't think there's consensus on uh, such a situation. Also, uh, if you look at the data set, uh, the trials, you know, I, I guess it really depends on the subtype of AML you're looking at also. Uh, clinical response criteria to 35 high-risk patients. Uh, failure to achieve CR seems to be the more, I guess it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Uh, ELN guidelines, uh, Therapy-related AML, these are all pretty standard. Extramedullary disease, uh, uh, some of us are still looking at those uh, extramedullary disease, white cell count as a, as a, as a level that, that, that we are using to consider them high risk. Does your institution do autologous transplantation uh, as part of consolidation treatment? So most of it for looks like for CBF and uh, APL, I think it's gradually being phased out already. Uh, but I think smattering uh, sites are in, also in, in, even anecdotally, once in a while, we do still uh, resort to autologous, but not as a standard uh, kind of protocol. And comments, uh, so the time, time point and everything. So uh, CR2 sometimes I wonder about the harvesting of the cells, uh, but most of us, uh, the, the, the responses are no, they're not done. Management of relapsed refractory AML uh, it runs a gamut of uh, various flight IDA, uh, ISA, sorry, venetoclax based combination, mitocentron, MEC. So, flight is a, a very common backbone here. Would you use targeted therapies for RR patients? Yes, most of the time. Uh, and uh, based on excess, uh, anything that uh, Prof. Wee was uh, just mentioning, I, I think it's all inside here. So, access is uh, always a question, I think, in Asia PAC. Uh, compassionate access seems to be uh, one of the easiest ways we can get it for free. Clinical trials, uh, once again, it depends on institution. If we are not an academic center, sometimes it might be very hard to uh, get into trials and may have to refer the patient out. 
trials, uh, do you conduct trials for APL and AML at your hospital? Looks like uh, three quarters, yes. Uh, do you refer them for trials to other centers? About half, 50-50 uh, kind of response. And uh, finally, on the establishment of consensus guidelines, do you see a need? I think most of us see a need for a development of consensus guidelines, uh, pro protocolized treatment of uh, AR, AML and MPL. Uh, I think uh, the one of the concerns is that uh, the standards of therapy and access may vary uh, quite widely across even across the region and maybe even across within the same country. So uh, there may be a need to uh, be a, to have a guideline that has a uh, uh, it's kind of a tailor made for specific regions and, and outside of a general framework and then we have a specific region based kind of a, a, a consensus uh, do you see a need or benefit for molecular to mobile once again 100 percent yes need and then i think most of us would think would agree that it does definitely there's a benefit uh, in terms of getting a much more uh, good consensus amongst the various experts on uh, what is the specific specific genotype for this patient? Uh, thank you very much, and that's all I have. And uh, yeah, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, don't don't hesitate to raise them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Lau. Um, are there any questions to the panelists or Dr. Lau at this stage? If not, then um, I'll just uh, try and generate some discussion. So um, one of the questions and responses was in relation to P53 mutation. And I think you listed 70% of people uh, want to get their patients to transplant. Um, in practice, what do you think is the proportion of your patients actually get to transplant? So maybe I'll go through the, the panel, uh, Dr. Wang. So in my hospital, maybe around half the patient will be allotted to an oral transplant. That really depends on the age, availability of a donor. So roughly half, half of them receive transplant. This is the situation in my hospital. So uh, specifically for TP53, I think I can come with one hand since uh, I've graduated. <laughs> that has actually gone into transplant and stay uh, in remission uh, post-transplant. Uh, I think most of them don't even have the time, uh, a runway to get into a remission uh, before transplant or post-transplant relapse rapidly uh, thereafter. Uh, so now I'm actually more and more con tilted towards doing a sequential therapy, lining up the transplant if they can wait and do a, a FLAMSA sequential kind of thing. And is your induction for patients with a P53 mutation still the same as if they didn't have a P53 mutation or is it different? So currently, I think uh, most of us are still doing 3 plus 7. Uh, more and more, I'm, I'm trying to find excuses to, to switch to an Aza van uh, type of thing. At least it's less toxic for them. Uh, I do get at least some patients uh, four to five months of response. and uh, But of course, not, not all of them are transplant eligible, but in theory, if those are transplant eligible, I might have a, a time frame for them at that point. Dr. Ho? Uh, I think in Taiwan, uh, we always want to transplant every TB53 mutated patient. However, in uh, reality, uh, because most uh, TB53 mutated patients are elderly, and uh, have a therapy related or secondary AML and uh, could not achieve the uh, better response before transplant and also has a higher early mortality. So according to our database, around 20% patient can be assessed to a transplant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the transplant outcome is still dismal. Uh, only the patient can achieve a complete remission uh, before transplant and uh, have a chance of a long-term uh, survival benefit. Any differences at your center, Dr. Kim? Same thing. Same. <laughs> <laughs> because you answered also similar, because the 
TPP3 mutated patients usually uh, didn't reach to the CR status. So elderly population, it's up, not up to transplantation or the comprimation is not very hardly reached. So very similar situation in South Korea. In terms of identifying uh, P53 mutation, as you know, most of the patients are elderly. Do you sequence um, all patients or are you more selective with your NGS testing? No. All patients, the, the elderly or younger patients, are the same, yep. same sequence. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like a, yeah, a pretty bleak situation for P53. Um, and although there's a desire for transplant, uh, the reality is it's, it's, it's challenging to get patients there. I think the problem for the P53 mutation, usually at, at the initial diagnosis, usually we use next generation. But it takes some time, maybe at least two weeks. But for this induction decision making, maybe you don't have any information on P53. Maybe you use the similar induction regimen compared to other kind of mutations. So this is one, maybe, maybe the one major issues for select induction therapy. Another thing is usually, I agree with our colleagues, due to their progress very rapidly. So in all my hospital, once we have this kind of information really discussed with our transplant colleagues, rapidly move the patient into the transplant program in order to get the benefit from the transplant. Otherwise, maybe you lose out this kind of chance. I know that um, one of my, uh, my previous hospital, um, there was a trial which was you know, the Magrolimab trial for P53 mutant cases. And the question was, do you have all your patients waiting three weeks for the results, um, which is not you know, ideal. Mm-hmm. So what we did was we just utilized cytogenetics because for us it came back more quickly. And if a patient has complex cytogenetics, then we would wait. Mm-hmm. And if they were not complex, we would not even consider the possibility of P53 because the frequency is quite low. So, so outside clinical trial setting, what do you think will be the optimal induction regimen for those with TPP3 mutations? Any suggestions from the panel? Uh, so to add on to Prof.Way's uh, uh, comment, we do have fish uh, for TPP3, so that one also has a pretty uh, rapid turnaround. Uh, I, I don't think we have something that is really uh, useful. Uh, like I said, I'm really moving more more and more towards uh, FLAMSA type of uh, cons- transplant, uh, consequential and transplant. And I tend to line up the transplant first before doing anything nowadays, uh, especially a lot of them are not hyper proliferative, right? They, they come in with low counts more than. Uh, so I tend to line up the transplant and, and get things in once they are in CR, try to quickly move them to transplant if possible. Uh, but but the, the dismal outcomes that you have with uh, TP53 mutated AML. So pre-transplant, if a person is MRD positive, is there actually any benefit at all that any of the panel members think that we need to do the transplant? Because almost all of them are going to relapse or we are just doing it to satisfy ourselves that we are doing something. What should be the approach there? Because sometimes we have a young patient, we feel bad for them, we do a transplant, but the end result is still that the person relapses post-transplant and you have just spent a whole lot of money on the allergenic stem cell transplant and everything. So, So till we get further, should we aim to get to MRD negativity at least before we do a transplant, which is being, which may be very difficult to achieve in this group of patients. So, so or do we go by what uh, Dr. Lau Zentang says? You just do a sequential and just pray for the best. I, I first, I would like to answer Eric's uh, question. Uh, uh, for uh, elderly or unfit patient, uh, I prefer to use a uh, medical space arrangement because we are aware the complete remission rate is higher, uh, even the uh, remission duration is shorter. So if a uh, patient can get uh, better, commu- uh, better disease control, 
you may use the reducing intensity transplant to induce a better outcome. For a patient uh, uh, with chemotherapy fit status, uh, I think uh, personally we prefer to use the Manitou class plus three and seven arrangement. Uh, I think according to uh, some uh, subgroup analysis, you can find the remission uh, rate is higher compared to the traditional regimen. But I think the, the most important is how to do something after transplant. Uh, usually in our history, we will uh, refer the patient into clinical trial first. If the clinical trial is not available uh, and the patient can uh, cannot be assessed to novel aging, we will try to uh, use a uh, perforated uh, donor lymphocyte infusion to e induce a better uh, post transplant disease control. And uh, if the patient uh, can be assessed uh, to novel aging, I say uh, a mental class or oral associativity uh, is, uh, is one choice. Even we need more clinical data to demonstrate how to uh, do something after transplant. The only thing I do differently is if the patient is, um, you know, quite elderly, you know, definitely not even a possibility for a transplant. Um, I've, I've stopped using venetoclax, so I just use oral as a cytidine um, because it's uh, purely a focus on quality of life. The other thing is Venasa has a very strong predilection to selecting for multi-hit disease. Um, and sometimes I feel it sort of makes the disease even more resistant. Uh, whereas single agent um, HMA um, does not appear to select for multi-hit uh, disease. Um, but I think the, the reality is that uh, these patients are, are destined to, to, to die and um, dying with minimal complications is more my goal for the older patients. Questions? Um, yeah, um, this is also about P53, I think. <laughs> um, so for younger patients with P53 uh, mutated AML that you actually bring to transplant, um, have you used post-transplant maintenance in them? Because I think the biggest hurdle probably in these patients is early relapse after the transplant, even if you get them to it. There was one, one intriguing paper, which uh, I, I recall, which was um, a US group, and they looked at patients who had a transplant, and the indication for the transplant was MRD positive or P53 mutant, and they gave single agent venetoclax maintenance post-transplant, and the 12 month survival was 70%, which I found sort of intriguing. I don't understand it, but uh, that's the only thing that I've seen in this group of patients, which looks vaguely uh, promising. Any other suggestions about post-transplant strategies um, for P53 mutant patients? But for this kind of high-risk patient, post-transplant, besides the maintenance therapy, I think more important thing is a early reduced immunosuppressor agent. So it's quite important. Maybe it's a routine practice for this kind of patient to for transplant, I think. Dr. Ho? Can we have the microphone switched on, please, for Dr. Ho? Yeah, it's OK. Uh, I, I, I just want to uh, echo Professor uh, Wei's uh, comment, uh, but I have a question regarding uh, hypermacidin aging uh, in uh, tb 3 mutated patient. Because uh, one study from Washington University demonstrated desirable 10 days uh, is very effective for patients with tb 3 mutation. Uh, but unfortunately, the following, the following study could not be dated this finding. Uh, but personally, uh, if the hypermacidin more uh, say, uh, aging is more safe is the choice. I would prefer to use a design uh, compared to elasticity. So I would like to ask the uh, every panel's comment and regarding this issue. Dr. Kim, do you do anything differently with your conditioning or post transplant strategies for these poor risk patients? Okay, the, the regardless of the MLD status before, even after the transplantation for specific subtype of TP53 mutation AML patients, there's no good answer yet, no consensus. But so as repeatedly, the, the Dr. Wang said, uh, the post-transplantation, only uh, withdrawal of immunosuppressant to induce the GVHD as a, the reinforcement of the GVL effect is the only way to enhance the 
the power of the eradication. So according to our, the, our own institution's data, uh, for the patient who received the transplantation, uh, regardless of the uh, uh, MRD status before transplantation, there's a good uh, the over survivor and uh, progression free survivor rate for the patient who received the transplantation with induced GBHD, almost twofold uh, difference between uh, groups. So, and then uh, the next choice uh, would be the, the, the recent uh, trial ongoing, but I'm not sure that the results yet, but uh, my rolling map, something like that. And then the, the immunotherapy, including the cell therapy such as uh, so for me, in our institution, we are going some uh, clinical trial in Korea, such as WT1 specific CTLs or something, and together with the NK or NKT, the memory NK like cells, as a, um, probably doing something, but not sure yet. Thanks. The other thing which I think is maybe underappreciated is that uh, I think patients with P53 mutation, they have they appear to have a more uh, greater susceptibility to infectious complications. Um, and there's some publications suggesting that there's an immune uh, immune uh, integrity issues, and uh, hence when you give myelosuppressive therapies, they get horrible infectious complications, which makes life even more 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 challenging. Maybe we should move on to something less uh, depressing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was interested in the survey where. Um, uh, for consolidation therapy of uh, fit patients, I think it was 88% uh, patients were kept in hospital. So I just wanted to maybe get a show of hands for your consolidation patients with uh, presumably intermediate or high dose RSC. Um, hands up if you keep your patients in until neutrophil recovery. Yeah, inpatient. And um, what proportion of centres manage their patients as a uh, inpatient, then outpatient recovery strategy. So it's actually two thirds in favour of inpatient um, admission. Um, are there are there bed pressures on on your department um, for because that will be a lot of people um, being in hospital for a long time? And um, what's the uh, there must be obviously logistical or reasons for that, Doctor Lau. I think uh, in our department, uh, definitely there's an interest in doing it outpatient. But uh, the realities of it is that if the patient has to come in, for example, at nine p.m., uh, has a fever at eight now has to come in by nine. Uh, how do we get this uh, arranged? We don't have a dedicated, uh, 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 the a &E doesn't have a dedicated pathway for this. Uh, coming to a ward who gets noticed, notified. Uh, so it's, it's mostly logistical. We, we, we were very keen to, 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 to explore this and we have put some patients on outpatient monitoring, but only very fit ones. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ho, like during, um, so you, you have your patients in patients as well? Yeah. yeah. What did you do during COVID? Did you, did you change your practice during COVID with consolidation or? Yeah. Earth to IT, microphone please. <laughs> Uh, I, I see in a uh, COVID pandemic, uh, usually we use the relative low dose uh, cytopy and uh, in outside and uh, in outpatient setting and to uh, just like the maintenance therapy and uh, to decrease the infection risk. Yeah. 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 Anybody from the audience want to comment on, on uh, management of patients during consolidation? Yes. Can we have a microphone to um, the back row, please? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Melissa Ui from NUH. So we actually do outpatient consolidation, but I think the most important thing is the caregiver. So we uh, determine whether there is a dedicated caregiver for the patient prior to enrolling them on an outpatient strategy. And then um, once we have that, actually everything else kind of uh, falls into place. So they come in for three times uh, monitoring and transfusions in our day center. And then uh, we don't have a dedicated um, service for coming in for fevers, but like with any chemotherapy, if they have fever, they come in through our emergency department. The patients are flagged up if they're on chemo, so they get triaged early. Um, and our ED would know what to do with them in terms of what is the first line. And then we have an inpatient um, a uh, hemong uh, registrar on service at night, so they would be assessing the patients as well. The other question I wanted to ask the panel was um, 
you know, when, when people use giltaritinib for primary refractory disease. So if you've got a fit patient, they've had seven and three mitostorin, uh, and they're not in remission after the first cycle, would you give another round of intensive chemotherapy first or will you switch immediately to, to giltaritinib? Um, uh, and the second question is, when would you say the giltaritinib is not working? After how how long would you would you would you give up, um, Dr. Wayne? Uh, first of all, first of all, I should mention that so, mitoren is not available in your country, so <laughs> I don't have other type. So you can use venetoclax for everything, but you have no monostorin. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. For but for relapse and refractory AML with free free three mutation, of course, only choice for gitaritinib. But for long time, for long time to use to determine the failure or success, maybe at least one month, I mm. think is is a is a is a time point for us to get the decisions. So if the patient's not in remission after one month of gilteritinib, you would switch to something right, else. Right, right, right. Maybe okay. can switch to the other kind of therapy therapy. In fact, if resistant to to gitaritinib, so Maybe for even for give other kind of service therapy, still I think we don't have optimal response. Even though we try, back, try, try very hard, still very poor. Dr. Zhenteng? Uh so uh, we do uh, for for re relapse refractory, refractory. You're talking about yeah, just so we, primary refractory. Just primary refractory. So we do switch to gilteritinib if possible, uh, and uh, there's a tendency to add in a uh, venetoclax. Uh, uh, to 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 deepen the response and uh, while well, bridging them to transplant if they are eligible. So you still to written it plus venetoclax. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe Dr. Ho or Dr. Kim. I, I see similar situation uh, is in Taiwan. Usually, uh, we use the more therapy, more therapy, uh, get more therapy. Uh, I, I, but for some uh, fit patient, uh, we will in combination with medical class to induce uh, early and uh, deeper response and followed by transplant. And uh, usually, uh, uh, two cycles of uh, uh, get uh, it's adequate to evaluate the treatment response. If the patient do not have any response, I will change it to another regimen. And do you, do you go to giltaritinib after failing one cycle of intensive or more? Uh, one cycle, one cycle. Yeah. And Dr. Kim? I'm saying, saying? I don't like the repetitive cycles of <laughs> mitosterine, so switch to the giltaritinib. Yeah. Yeah. And with respect to um, you know, the really provocative data on FLT3-MRD and transplant outcomes, um, has that changed any of your practices at this stage or, or are you just transplanting as long as the patient's in remission? Maybe Dr. Kim, do you want to start this time? Actually, it's a difficult question because in Korea, just uh, the, the gilteritin is permitted only two cycles so by reimbursement. So had to decide uh, <laughs> either way yeah. before the cycle, so completion of the cycle. So I'm not sure, but in theoretically, have to wait two to three cycles more, but yeah. anyway. Do, do any centers actually have access to FLT3 MRD testing at this stage? Uh, are any centres? Oh, yes, you do. Yeah. Are any centres um, looking to to develop for three MRD in the in the lab? Okay. All right. Do you want to comment on how you use for three MRD in your centre at this stage? Thanks. I don't think we actually use it to direct um, our therapy. We just have use it as a prognostication. Now, I think um, for those who post-transplant who still MLD uh, become detectable, we we'll probably use gilteritinib to, um, well, because gilteritinib is not like, well, uh, we burst in our country. So um, we have to, um, so if the patient can afford, we use it as a, what we call a self-finance item and the patient can use it as the maintenance therapy is MLD is still detectable. Yeah. Okay. But the, the follow-up question is, let's say if we have a patient, treatry ITD, MRD detectable before transplant. Would you like to go ahead with the transplant and then if still MRD detectable, you use it gilteritinib as maintenance or you use gilteritinib before transplant to make it MRD undetectable and then do the transplant? It's a good question. So we, we had our cooperative group meeting and we discussed this and um, there's a guy waving his hand vigorously at the back. Is there a reason for that? No, no, it's a tech. Sorry? It's a tech. Oh, it's a tech. Okay. 
Um, so uh, one question is whether we need to do a, a randomised study. So if they're FLIP3 MRD positive, going to transplant, randomised to you know at least one cycle of a ven based so guilt based therapy versus not um, but these are very challenging situations because if you've got a patient who's mrd positive um, trying to randomize to not giving something when something's available would be very challenging uh, for, for for transplant doctors and physicians alike um, so at the moment we have a trial where we can give guilt ven um, MRD, so the trial is planned hope, hopefully to start next year um, and the plan will be to give one or two cycles depending on when the transplant's ready, monitor MRD and if it becomes positive again then reintroduce a guilt-based therapy but that's not randomised. Yep, that's time. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks everyone for, um, for, for listening to the session. Thanks to all the panellists for the vigorous and interesting discussion. And we'll pass over to the chairs of the uh, next session, um, Dr. T and Dr. Suporn Chuchano Ni. Yes. Thanks, uh, Andrew Chen uh, Xiang, for the very nice uh, chairing. Thank you very much. So it occurs to me that there's a lot to discuss. In, in fact, uh, even after spending extra time and so much, we barely scratch the surface of AML. You know, we spend so much time on P53, <laughs> but there's still so much more to be discussed. And even, um, even the other sessions too, is really quite exciting and I'm really quite encouraged. Um, and also another thing to remind, um, you saw the survey, uh, oh, we have about 40 over members. Uh, I think each survey only like less than 20 and I know you know Ashley and group spent a lot of time crafting the survey, Lynn spent a lot of time reminding you all. So can you all please go back and then uh, we'll send out reminders again and fill up the survey. So we have, the more information we have, the better we are be equipped to actually deal with all the problems. Okay, So we actually have a lot of work to do uh, but it's very exciting. Now we need to move on to the next session which is industry engagement and uh, I think the senior members of the group that started, we realized from the start that color, uh, in the, is a partnership with industry is very important to actually uh, 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 attain our objectives of bringing the best care to our patients. Okay, not only through like drug delivery, drug tests, uh, managing drug toxicities, and so forth. So we made a very special point to engage our industry partners. And this is quite unique to our, our session that we have a session for our industry to come on board and actually present and then showcase what they have and have a dialogue with us. I think this is very, very nice session to allow us to do that. And also it also occurred to me also that uh, Novartis and Abby are not here. We had a Mitostarin and Venetoclax is not available in some of the countries. So, so it is quite important because in such basic drugs, uh, it's quite sad that it's not available. But if so, Novartis and Abby can be here, but we'll kind of convey the message back to them. And maybe for the next next year's meeting and so forth, a lot of the uh, the, the industry needs actually uh, the uh, the various countries to actually ask for for for, for cooperation for for us different countries. It is very complex for them to get funding. Right, so that will help if you can go to your, let's say you don't see Novartis here, you don't see Evie here, go to your China Novartis, your Australia Evie and say, can you please come and, and, and support us for the next meeting. This is an advertisement, okay? So, uh, Supon and myself, we would we'll like to invite our, our, our members uh, to actually present, uh, showcase our data. And our very first goal sponsor is MGEM and uh, our presenter is uh, Kope Chang. Kope is uh, the medical director for JPEG Hematology Group. Thanks, Kope. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gao, and uh, thank you, APALC, uh, for NGEN has this opportunity to introduce uh, to the audience. Yeah, NGEN is a biotechnology uh, company. Uh, I am the uh, JPEG uh, uh, Hematology Medical uh, Director uh, in Asia Pacific area. So uh, before uh, I introduce NGEN, uh, our uh, Asia Pacific Medical Lead, Victoria, uh, want to say something to the audience. the Asia-Pacific region for Amgen and also the global lead for our access to healthcare strategy. 
This morning, we are very honoured as Amgen to be a golden sponsor of the first Asia-Pacific Leukaemia Consortium Summit, which is an event that brings together experts and researchers in the field of leukaemia. We are a global leader in biotechnology, and we have a mission to serve patients with serious illnesses. We believe that by developing medicines that offer significant clinical benefits for high unmet medical needs, we improve the lives of patients, but we also reduce the social and economic impact of disease in society today. We focus on areas where there's a high unmet medical need. Amgen has been a pioneer and in fact was the first biotechnology company and is today the largest biotechnology company since 1980. Amgen operates in about 100 countries and regions worldwide. And our medicines have helped millions of people who suffer from illness such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and many more. One of the serious illnesses that Amgen is committed to addressing is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Patients with relapsed or refractory ALL have very poor outcomes, as relapses are frequent and survival rates are low. The future of ALL treatment looks very bright. We continue to see new research demonstrating improvements in treatment outcomes. At Amgen, we're focused on how we can improve the experience of patients in the future by minimizing chemotherapy and its side effects, and by also exploring different administration options. We hope that you enjoy this Congress and learn from the presentations and discussions. We are very honored to be here and we're looking forward to collaborating with you in the advancing the science and practice of leukemia treatment. Thanks so much for being here, and we look forward to our long and continued partnerships and interactions. Engine headquarter uh, is on the west coast uh, of United States, uh, Southern Oaks, California. Uh, this is the changes uh, for the past uh, 40 years uh, Engine campus. And uh, uh, during the past 40 years, the uh, chemo uh, chemotherapy, uh, the uh, on oncology treatment the, is also uh, have involvement the, from the chemotherapy to the uh, target therapy, uh, immunotherapy, and also uh, cell therapy or uh, genetic uh, therapy in the future. The. So uh, engine approach uh, is not a try and error to development the, uh, medication. The, uh, engine utilize uh, biology first, modality second approach. Biology engine where you uh, uh, doing research on the uh, target uh, we we can uh, uh, we can use the, and also understand the mechanism of uh, this disease or this target the, uh, in the disease involvement. The. Also uh, engine has uh, in-house uh, own the, uh, uh, modality, drug modality. So we can choose uh, the best modality to design the drug uh, and also uh, use this uh, modality uh, advantage uh, to uh, to do uh, to do the clinical development. The, the next one is about the benefit. The, yeah, we want to uh, enhance the likelihood uh, for the uh, drug uh, success. The, also, the efficiency to development of, of the drug. The, also, uh, have the drug with uh, the deep impact uh, to the disease and bring uh, uh, most uh, uh, the uh, best benefit uh, to patient. So, uh, engine oncology the advanced the all angles of care uh, for patient and those uh, who uh, care for them. Uh, these are the uh, modality uh, used, uh, engine used. Uh, we have uh, the patent, uh, the in-house manufacturer capability. The, so you may know, uh, such as the monoclonal antibody, also uh, the bite, bite specific T cell engager, also uh, the precision uh, medicine uh, in small uh, uh, molecular. And also, uh, we have the uh, ADC antibody drug conjugated, but the uh, uh, engine not use uh, ADC in oncology or hematology. We use ADC in general medicine, obesity. So it's currently undergoing phase two uh, study. And also, we have the in-house capability to develop uh, SIRNA drug. Currently, is on a phase three uh, clinical trial. So these are the list uh, for the engine clinical trial. For the oncology hematology, uh, we uh, we target uh, on this uh, 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 drug target. Uh, this target are uh, uh, in clinical development uh, all around uh, the world. And uh, uh, for the oncology hematology, uh, we focus on lung cancer, prostate cancer, and the GI cancer. 
also uh, multiple myeloma uh, acute leukemia. Uh, and the currently uh, is the uh, related uh, compound uh, in clinical development or uh, in the market. Currently, uh, I want to, uh, today I want to emphasize or introduce the uh, bite uh, immune oncology uh, technology. For this uh, bi-specific uh, antibody, the concept is initiated in 1980, but uh, uh, bring tumor uh, the first bite compound uh, treated uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia uh, is in the market in 2014. But uh, there is also uh, some uh, improvement, uh, improvement we needed uh, for the uh, bite uh, compound. Uh, currently, uh, Engend already uh, advanced and improved uh, this uh, bite compound. The first compound uh, you see uh, is Blinatimumab. It's a, a short uh, uh, half-line, so uh, uh, it, it has, uh, has to be a continued infusion. But the second one uh, is the half-line extended uh, by specific uh, uh, antibody bite. It's Tanatamab. And uh, uh, in uh, 2024, uh, it will uh, be in the market uh, for small cell lung cancer. And uh, the next one is uh, 2 plus 1 uh, Zen body, uh, by specific antibody. You can see uh, it uh, can engage, uh, it, it has two domains uh, to link uh, the cancer target, and only one domain uh, to link the T cell CD3. This will uh, less trigger uh, T cell, uh, so uh, uh, in this way, the, uh, it will uh, not uh, uh, increase uh, too much uh, cytokine release syndrome. Uh, one week ago, the, it's already uh, announced the phase two data for uh, uh, prostate cancer, the, so quickly uh, it will advance to phase, uh, the, uh, phase three study. The. And the next uh, one uh, is we call the uh, human heavy chain antibody. The. Uh, this has the advantage uh, for the uh, manufacture uh, process. Uh, you can see uh, it has uh, different affinity for the uh, target and also uh, anti-CD3. And all the protein domain is linked. So uh, when the uh, cell uh, manufacture uh, this protein compound, we don't need to cut it into uh, the, uh, the, the part we needed. It can be direct uh, to used. And uh, these are the leukemia study and uh, ongoing in Asia Pacific area. Area. We have the Bilinatumumab in front line uh, uh, combined uh, alternated uh, with uh, low dose, uh, uh, low intensity chemotherapy versus uh, the standard uh, chemotherapy uh, in uh, newly diagnosed uh, B cell precursor AOL uh, population. Also, uh, we have the subcutaneous formulation, it's a uh, half line extended Bilinatumumab uh, 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 clinical uh, research uh, ongoing. We also have the uh, cafezomib uh, pediatric uh, study ongoing in Asia Pacific areas. And the engine uh, is open uh, for the clinical research partnership uh, with a physician or investigator. So you can submit your idea uh, in uh, www.engineiss.com. You can uh, direct uh, contact our scientist, also a global medical lead, uh, to seek input. And also, uh, engine uh, is well can any in innovation of solution in drug development. So any innovative idea, you can go to www.nginbd.com and submit your proposal. It will link to the right uh, scientist research and also uh, business development person uh, uh, to discuss uh, the possibility uh, for the funding uh, uh, or advance uh, uh, the uh, cooperation. Uh, that's my introduction. Uh, so our mission is to serve patient and I uh, hope you like uh, this information and my introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Kopi. Thanks, Kopi. So um, thanks uh, for your information. Uh, Victoria was uh, actually among the very first to actually talk about this group or collaborative group. And uh, it's through her and a small group of us that this uh, idea of APLC first was conceived and they've been supporting us all the way. So we're very uh, glad that MJ is here today. Our next uh, sponsor is uh, AstraZeneca and uh, to present on behalf is uh, Drupad, Southeast Asia Medical Affairs Manager and uh, uh, he's for Himong and rare diseases. Thanks, Drupad. And thanks, Prof. Gu. Um, on behalf of AstraZeneca, 
thanks everyone and thanks to APLC uh, for providing this opportunity to showcase what we are doing in hematology. So the bold ambition what we are carrying as AstraZeneca, so our bold aspiration is to be the pioneer in science and lead in our disease areas and transform the patient outcome. And by 2030, so we will deliver 20 new medicines uh, and be also a carbon negative company by 2030. So the key components in our gold ambition, what we are looking is the pioneer in science, uh, where we can say that high impact publications and the keynote conference participations, uh, which I can say that we're currently doing in the solid tumor and leaders in the, our disease areas, like leading positions on the reputations, both in the patients and in the payers and transform a patient outcomes by practice changing medicines and also including the key data in the guidelines. And the 20 new medicines, uh, mainly the 20 new molecular entities, uh, both in oncology and hematology by 2030, and also being a carbon negative uh, because of the current concern of the global warming. So what is the current focus in the AstraZeneca oncology? So as you can clearly see, uh, we are more focused on immuno-oncology than the DNA damage response and tumor drivers and resistance antibody drug conjugates and cell therapies and epigenetics. So all these three, six areas are the key focus both in solid tumor and also in the liquid tumor for AstraZeneca. So how best, like what, what currently we are thinking for hematology as we know maybe, um, yes, AstraZeneca is relatively new to hemat. So what we are uh, currently focusing is like, can we think of cure for a liquid hematology? Uh, a curing cancer, maybe moving from a non-curable blood malignancy towards a more towards curing a blood cancer and how we can use the current existing novel modalities. Uh, can we think of like a chemo versus no chemo free regimens uh, in, the hem in the hem malignancies and what is the optimal role of a new class of drugs which could be an antibody drug conjugates or CAR-Ts or bispecifics and uh, should we still think of very intensive chemo regimens or will we opt for a targeted therapies in the hemat malignancies and uh, what is the role of stem cell transplantation in the near future considering all these new novel therapies uh, emerging in this area and the uh, emerging treatment paradigm mainly focusing on the MRD uh, how best we can use the MRD for a finite treatment and also can we consider MRD as a point for a cure of hemat malignancies. Uh, so we are, these are the four pillars what currently uh, we are considering in terms of improving the treatment outcome and the cure rate for patients with blood cancer. So can we intercept at the early stage uh, where we are considering of clonal hematopoiesis of in differentiating potential or inter intermediate potential or maybe a common progenitor cell or maybe intervene early with early diagnosis or maybe during the disease uh, established stage where we can think of a multiple combination therapies. Uh, and the last which may be an eradicate with the help of MRD. So these are the four common pillars what we are currently looking. And uh, so with this, the two strategies is the one is the surface heterogeneity and then there is a molecular heterogeneity. So surface uh, heterogeneity is where we are thinking of a T cell engager or a CAR or maybe an ADC. And the molecular heterogeneity is more of a chemo in combinations with the novel therapies or a small molecules and the ADCs. Uh, so as we know, everyone knows like AstraZeneca as the second generation Bruton Thyrosine kinase, which is an acalabrutinib. So from an acalabrutinib clinical developmental standpoint, uh, we have uh, approved and indicated for CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. And uh, maybe the next future indication will be more towards the diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, the new things which are we are currently prioritized and we're currently working, the first is the T cell engaging antibody, uh, which is the AZD0486. It's a CD3 and CD19 bispecific. Uh, currently uh, evaluating for the mainly for the NHL. Uh, in the last year, Ash, we have presented the phase two data for follicular lymphoma uh, and also for the relapse and refractive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we're looking forward to present the subsequent long-term follow-up data in the um, in the upcoming ash. So, how does it differ from the existing anti maybe the bispecific or CD20? So, which is very uh, in terms of the affinity for CD19, which is very specific, and also a minimal cytokine release uh, because the major concern with us uh, the T cell engager the cytokine releasing. So, the current studies shows like the minimum release of the cytokine. Uh, and also like a minimal off-target T-cell activations are the key features what we have identified in this T-cell uh, by specific. 
and uh, maybe def uh, definitely going forward we want to expand into a, apart from follicular lymphoma into a diffuse large cell build form uh, the next one is the immune checkpoint inhibitor so which is the azd 7789 uh, which is currently, I can say, in the preclinical and the in vivo study stage, uh, where we have seen like more than 70% uh, reduction in the tumor cells uh, in the Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, the, moving on to the antibody drug conjugates, uh, these are the very new uh, preliminary, uh, the AZD9829, uh, which is the topo isomerase inhibitor for CD123 uh, for AML, and AZD0305, uh, which is the uh, G protein coupled for uh, C5D. Uh, maybe I can say it's going uh, to. We have recently acquired the, this molecule. Uh, the current in vivo studies shows very promising. Uh, looking forward, how best we can use this uh, in the future for multiple myeloma. So how? So the the drugs what I've shown and what we are currently looking and how best we can use this uh, in the four major thera disease areas. What we are thinking uh, for a multiple myeloma. Uh, can we use it as a first line, uh, maybe an add-on to the first line backbone, uh, maybe as a T-cell engager plus lenalidomide or protease inhibitor, or it could be an antibody drug conjugate, what I've just presented in combination with the backbone, or can we consider it for the second line uh, plus a backbone, whether it could be a T-cell engager or antibody drug conjugate. And for CLL, um, Definitely, it is still in the discussion phase, I can say, whether we can use a T-cell engager or antibody drug conjugate uh, in combination with a BTK or a BTK plus BCL2 because, yeah, the current, uh, the scientific science is more towards uh, using combination of a BTK and BCL2 as a time-limited therapy. And for AML, so the this almost similar to the multiple myeloma approach. We want to use it as an add-on to the backbone, uh, which is an HMA or a venetoclax, um, or maybe but we do have some pipelines for the next next generation of venetoclax. Uh, then maybe can we use it in the second line as a backbone for TCE and ADC. And for B-cell lymphoma, uh, currently, as I said, the AZD0486 uh, as an add-on for the current existing strategy for rituximab plus chemotherapy, or can we use it as a second line in the backbone? So what's uh, what you can expect for the acalabrutinib. So acalabrutinib currently for a CLL standpoint, uh, the two major studies is the Amplify. Amplify is a time-limited treatment strategy whether where acalabrutinib in combination with venetoclax or in combination with obinutuzumab as a 12-month MRD-driven treatment strategy for treatment 9. And uh, yeah, morning there were a few questions like is there any study for a uh, challenging vivo? So there is a study called MAGIC where acalabrutinib in combination with venetoclax versus vivo as a time-limited therapy for 12 months or 24 months as a MRD-driven treatment strategy. And for mantle cell lymphoma, so we are doing um, as like for the first generation, like the Phoenix, like uh, acalabrutinib in combination with bendamustine rituximab as an echo study. Uh, we are expecting the data will be available by next year. And for diffuse large cell lymphoma, so uh, as in, in combination with ARCHOP for acalabrutinib, uh, the study is ongoing. Uh, we are currently recruiting, so hoping that by 2025, 2026, we'll be present in this data. So this is the strong pipeline, what we are currently, so yes, so the, the future for AstraZeneca hematology looks promising. Uh, we, we have so many clinical studies has been prioritized, so. Yeah, so the key priorities will be the CD19 and CD3 TCE for the uh, mainly indication for the lymphomas. And then for within the ADC, uh, which is the CD22 and uh, GPCFRB has been prioritized uh, mainly for the multiple myeloma. And uh, these are all the other uh, key targets what we are currently evaluating. And uh, definitely, so we're looking forward to work with you all uh, for all these uh, new targets and any kind of an approach or any kind of a new study designs or new study concepts. Uh, definitely you can reach out to AstraZeneca Medical Affairs and also AstraZeneca ESR portal, uh, which is uh, available in the public domain. So with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, APLC. Thank you. Thanks, Drupal. Okay. Moving on, we have Jensen. Uh, we have great pleasure to invite uh, Mike Ekenhead. He's the, uh, uh, the Regional uh, Medical Director for Leukemia and Lymphoma for Jensen Asia Pacific. You're welcome, Mike. No need music, no time ready. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Mike Aikenhead, and I am Jansen's regional medical lead for lymphoma and leukemia. 
Uh, on behalf of my APAC colleagues, I want to thank the APLC for the opportunity to sponsor this summit and also to provide an overview of Janssen's haematology portfolio uh, with a focus on myeloid and B-cell malignancies. Oops, sorry, just made back a slide. So at Janssen Oncology, we have a bold vision and it's the elimination of cancer. Now our, our vision is underpinned by 30 years of innovation in oncology with first in class treatments such as abrutinib and daratumumab that have transformed patients' lives and established new standards of care. Now we're continuing to pursue this vision by developing transformational regimens to achieve cure or prevent disease progression. So this is an overview of Janssen's haematology pipeline, showing the different compounds and their stages of development. We have three focus areas, as you can see here, that's myeloid, B-cell, and myeloma. Now I'll briefly talk through the next few slides over our key assets in myeloid and B-cell malignancies. Now with abrutinib, we're exploring a path to cure with novel combinations. So you should all be familiar with I plus V. So I plus V is an all oral fixed duration therapy that combines two complementary mechanisms in a synergistic combination. Now, as you can see from the slide, I plus V is transforming outcomes for older frontline CLL patients with an overall survival advantage with four years follow-up. In addition, it provides durable treatment-free interval with nine out of 10 patients not requiring subsequent treatment at the four-year time point. And finally, long-term follow-up has shown no new safety signals and importantly, no TLS events. So beyond abrutinib, Janssen is committed to developing new therapies for B-cell malignancies. This includes two investigational CD20-directed autologous CAR-T therapies that have shown promising response rates in phase one studies in China. We also are pursuing uh, synthetic small molecules and targeting the B-cell receptor. And I'll just draw your attention to MOLT1 inhibitor uh, which could potentially overcome acquired resistance associated with BTK inhibitors. We're also developing an array of T-cell redirectors uh, with different binding targets and different affinities for CD3. I'll just briefly cover the one at the bottom there, which is our tri-specific antibody, JNJ8543. Now, JNJ8543 is a tri-specific antibody that binds CD20 and CD79B and CD3 on T cells. The drug is in a phase one dose escalation study to look for recommended phase two dose and optimal dosing schedule with data expected in 2024. Now for myeloid malignancies, I just wanna highlight one agent and that's our menin KMT2A inhibitor. Now JNJ6617 is an oral potent and selective protein-protein inhibitor of the interaction between KMT2A and menin. Inhibiting this pathway is a potentially attractive target for acute leukemias, particularly in patients with KMT2A or MPM1 alterations. Now this compound is in a phase one study with data again expected in 2024. Now thank you for your time. And I just want to use a few moments to show you a video that will just highlight Abrutinib's role in transforming patients' outcomes in CLL. With close to 10 years in the market, Imbruvica has benefited over 290,000 patients worldwide and is the BTKI with the most extensively studied efficacy and tolerability profile. Imbruvica is proven to deliver patients with treatment-naive CLL the chance of a similar life expectancy to that of the general population. long-term follow-up and real-world experience reinforce the proven clinical benefits of Imbruvica across CLL patient subgroups, including high-risk patients. Imbruvica offers a convenient once-daily dosing for patients. In addition, tailored dosing adjustments allow the majority of patients to resolve side effects, stay on treatment, and achieve proven clinical benefits, including prolonged survival. We have a vision, and it's bold. It's the elimination of cancer. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike.
Thank you very much. For the next one, we have uh, Pusha Khani from Beijing. She is the senior medical advisor of East Asia. So Pusha, please. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Sapon, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you once again to APLC for this opportunity. Beijing is spearheading a new biotech model, and our mission is to bring the most impactful medicines to the greatest number of people facing cancer. In our, in, our inse from our inception in 2010, we have actually expanded our clinical trial footprint, and we currently have trials spanning 45 countries and regions with more than 16,000 people enrolled in greater than 100 clinical trials. Our world-class oncology R&D engine covers 80% of the world's cancers by incidence. We have 16 internally discovered molecules in clinical development as of 2023, with three internally developed cancer medicines approved. Of these three approved medicines, Rukinza or Zanubrutinib has been approved in more than 65 markets globally, including several countries in the APAC region. After a prolific first decade, we are now entering a new era of discovery. And come 2024, our vision is to have 10 new molecules in the clinic on an annual basis. So just to highlight two of our key products from the hematology portfolio, so the BTKI inhibitor of Brookinza, it's being developed as monotherapy as well as in combination in B cell malignancies. And the second product I'd like to highlight is our BCL2 inhibitor, BGB1147, that is being developed in AML MDS. This is an overview of our portfolio and pipeline. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions after this. Thank you very much. So the next one will be from Astellas. Uh, I'd like to invite Jamie and Medical Information Directors, please. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to present the Giltoridinib Clinical Development Program. I'm Jamie Ann. Um, I'm the Medical Director for Zospada, covering Asia, PAC, Latin America, and Middle East, Africa, Russia. So these are the disclaimers. Um, as you all know, giltaridinib inhibits both FLIP3 ITD and FLIP3 TKD, and, uh, and it, which are well-characterized mutations, AML, and are associated with poor prognosis. So giltaridinib is currently being investigated for treatment at different stages in the treatment pathway. Um, here we selected some key trials that are ongoing. Newly diagnosed FLIP3 mutation AML who are fit for high intensive chemotherapy and newly diagnosed FLIP3 mutation AML patients who are unfit for high intensive chemotherapy. So, uh, and as you know, in the relapse refractory hour registrational study was the phase three admiral study, which was replicated for Asian patients in the Commodore study, um, which was conducted in China, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Russia. And we're also doing a relapse refractory study in children, adolescents, and young adults in combination with chemo. So as mentioned in the previous slide, um, the ongoing study PASHA is a phase three study targeting FLIP3 AML and MDS patients who are uh, fit for high intensive chemotherapy. Uh, and the primary endpoint for this study is OS and recruitment is ongoing. For Viceroy, it's a phase one, two study and we are targeting um, just to go back on PASHA, though, is a, this is a comparison study of mitostorin and gilteridinib. And for Visoroy, it's a phase one, two study looking at the triplet regimen of gilteridinib, um, Venasa, and in patients who are FLIP3 mutation AML in, uh, eligible for intensive induction chemotherapy. Um, Skipper study, as mentioned before, is targeting children, adolescent, and young adult patients with FLIP3 mutation uh, who are in combination with chemotherapy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite Kun Chao Ek, Jalen Sapapud, Southeast Asia Product Manager from BMS for BMS presentation. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Supon, Prof. Go, and APLC for this opportunity. Uh, 
again, on behalf of the Bristol Myers Group, I'm Shawek, uh, Southeast Asia Senior Product Manager. I would like to present our future BMS MyLine assets and pipelines. Let's start at uh, Oral Asia Sadidin. Um, in Asia, we currently launch in Korea and Singapore, and we will launch in Thailand, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Malaysia within the next year and going on. Not only just approved indication we have in maintenance therapy for ML patients who have already complete remission after intensive chemotherapy and not planned for stem cell transplant. We still have more going on trials in post stem cell transplant, AML, relapse and refractory AML, maintenance in high risk MDS, and more active trials, which we'll uh, recruit soon. Beyond that, we also have more BMS pipelines in many ongoing trials, such CK1 alpha degrader to leverage targeted protein degradation pathway, anti SIRP alpha antibody to stimulate phagocytosis of tumor cell. We also have a CD33 natural killer cell engager which direct cytotoxic effector cell activity to the tumor. All these are our commitment to improve patient quality of life and transform patients' lives through science, and we will not stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, this session is open for discussions. Any questions to both ways? I I'd ask the farmer or, or vice versa. Quite a lot to digest. So um, one possibility is that the APLC are set up such that sometimes it may be quite difficult to go through their platform as you and you and you and so forth. So if you have ideas, you can actually surface at your working group of working group debate on it, and then if there's a plausible the work group agrees, then they go up to the the, the, the bigger trial group, and then we can actually engage the farmer for you, and it may be easier to actually engage them in that way. So we heard of some ideas with guilt and uh, guilt and and some of the other uh, products. The, that we mentioned so so and some of it could be like asia the uh, pacific type of focus you know where, where cost is an issue where we we do like trials that are limit more maybe cost effective in terms of continuous therapy where can we stop mrd given guidelines or something like that so things like that are actually quite interesting for asia pacific and obviously the other, the other group will be uh diseases or unmet needs that are within asia pacific It's been a very long day. Um, to, to be honest, I think the discussions went much better than I expected to, for a first meeting. For the myeloma group, the first meeting, nobody talked at all. So this one actually has been very, 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 very good, really. So very, very grateful for everybody. Now, um, we, we're we going to have a breakout group session after this, but uh, 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 the uh, it's actually half an hour, but um, the, uh, the, there's the dinner that we're announcing for tonight. But uh, we actually have booked the rooms for all the way up to 6 o'clock. So it depends on how long your working group chairs keep, keep you. So the more how working, working groups work harder, we have less time for break for your, for your dinner, to prepare for dinner. Okay. So maybe, uh, Supon, you can close for us and then you can always continue to engage our uh, pharmaceutical colleagues, our industry colleagues. You've met them and the, the whole team is here. You can actually talk during tea times. Uh, any ideas you have, I'm quite sure they'll be very happy to actually interact with you all. Well, before closing this section, I think I would like to ask all of us to take group photos. They are ready for us. Group Thank photo, you. very important. Can, can, can you give us instruction? Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to have your kind cooperation to pack and keep your own belonging for the group photo section. As the hotel staff will clear all the tables and the chairs, so may have your cooperation together, please. And also after the coffee break, we will continue for the breakout group with three sections. The age of your batch, they will have your breakout groups. And also the breakout group will be con uh, separate with ALL, we meant in this meeting room, and CLL at the Plunchit 1, and then AML in Plunchit 2. 
So which is just opposite. 